presentation will be in line with all possible problems prepared for previous uh, presentation. If natural degassing of carbon can actually uh, trigger both climate changes and also extinctions, we'll look at the Earth for history. And the, 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 top, the focus is really to look at large emission promises. I guess most of you are familiar with the term large emission promises. It's basically uh, enormous uh, uh, outpourings of, of laws, uh, in places at their servers, uh, covering uh, millions of square kilometers of land with models. Associated with these large emission promises, of course, the biomass engine will first for uh, um, uh, running at the servers. And I'm particularly interested in what happens. Uh, during the, the ascent of, of the magma, when, especially when the magma enters sedimentary basins. So, from the geology, we know that there has been more than eight mass extinctions in the last 150 million years. Of course, most of you know the end extinction, the blue stone, uh, the Triassic, and of course the gate boundary. So, the Earth lost a lot of this uh, of exotic uh, species that we see in natural history in the museums. The question is, of course, uh, why? Uh, if you look at some of these local events like the Edinburgh due to the Dune years ago, the biggest extinction uh, occurred in Marine and the rest of the world, and it was associated perhaps with global warming. Also, if you look at the Triassic, not too many years ago, Marine and terrestrial extinction, also global warming. Uh, we can go to the Tarsia, which happened in the early Jurassic, or more than three million years ago, global warming and Marine mar mar extinction. We call it mine extinction. The PTM fell in the Eastern Thermal Maximum about 56 million years ago, global warming, and then uh, also minor deep marine extinction. So, uh, do we have any suspects for all this? Could it be something linking all these extinction events to something uh, that we can study, some kind of geological process that is behind this? Or is uh, everything simple dealing with a uh, separate type of events that's not directly linked uh, together? Well, I've heard I mentioned the global warming. So for most of these, they, they are associated with some type of global warming uh, effects. Uh, in addition, they also correlate in time with the formation of large events provinces. Um, there are some uh, exceptions to this, but most of them, and uh, certainly the major ones, they call it the large events provinces. So now, of course, the question is, is there a direct link, or is this simply a coincidence? I usually show this uh, in presentations. It's kind of like the history of, in the audience. Of course, it's a uh, supercomputer modeling, and it shows the impact of the, the boundary. So this is the main explanation for the, for the case of boundary. Uh, but in fact, if you look at this diagram again with time and extinctions, this is the only event that certainly is associated with an impact event. So in a way, it can be ruled out a list that's the like, common belief among um, most people for these sort of events. And this brings me to a list of fun facts. Uh, I call them fun facts, but in a way, it's what we call sad facts. Uh, impact researchers, what they say about impacts? The most impact guys, they're always uh, search of course for impacts and also explain extinctions and also uh, this uh, rapid bomb events in your history by impacts. If you go to what the model is, of course they play about volcanic degassing. The marine geologists, they uh, typically favor dissociation of gas rates or changing ocean currents. The list goes on. Metamorphic geologists, biogenic CO2 release, for instance, uh, uh, explain uh, the uh, ESC and climate changes. Personally, I have a product like metamorphism and gas is released from uh, organic matter in sedimentary basins. And this is a topic I've been working on for the last uh, seven, eight years. And it's really been driving this type of research uh, here at uh, PGP. Of course, I'm aware of all these other explanations, but my, my motivation is to try to explore this uh, hypothesis. So, uh, what do I think actually happens when large and promises go through the crust? And what is the, uh, the link between this type of process, which are called volcanic basin processes, and these boundary events in Earth history? Uh, well, imagine this being a uh, basalt lava. Uh, uh, we had a degassing forming these large emission promises. Here's the picture of the schematic uh, um, sedimentary basin. We had these lines coming into the basin, we have sills. Uh, the basin might be composed of organic sediments, the sediments that heated, methane and CO2 is formed. 
you get bench pressures. Uh, in some ways, they are similar to volcanoes, but we work with mostly gas compared to, to magma. <clears throat> we have, of course, lava we have saved, the CO2 is coming out of lava. Uh, some of the lava could be contaminated by this organic matter, also the gas and methane. Um, so, this is basically the setting that I'm exploring. Now, the size of, 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 of volcanic basins can be uh, immense. For instance, uh, uh, a well known volcanic basin in South Area is at least 2 million square kilometers so large. So this is really big, uh, big uh, geological settings at on the same scale as uh, the whole pouring of the, the lavas. What is interesting here is, is the time scales. Now, I'll go back to that a bit, a bit later, but if you look at volcanic eruptions, of course, for current time scale, it takes two months and, and maybe years. Um, if you look at lava flows, for instance, in logic provinces, um, days to months probably, uh, probably extending also to, to, the, to 10 to 20 years uh, duration time for really big adjacent uh, uh, events. Civil attritions, this is a bit hard to say, but probably on the same time scale as, as lava flows. Uh, what is, is certain is that they can extend uh, almost up to thousands of kilometers in, uh, in, in aerial extent. So, for that, it, in, yeah, in most cases, the time is not like instantaneous, but at the same time, they, they have to uh, keep, uh, uh, keep us liquid in order to, to, of course, flow. So, it's, it's a rapid process. So, uh, these volcanic basins, where do we find them and where do we actually find these large transformances? This is a nice population. So, basically, everything you see in bed is, is uh, surface or submarine uh, seafloor lower uh, uh, provinces. Uh, this is South Area, formed at the same time as the end of the mass extinction. You see the, the, the sort of flows. And what we don't see here is the associated volcanic basin. It's basically underneath the lavas and also in this exterior arch. Uh, I've been working in Peru Basin in South Africa. The only remnant part of the lava is this tiny little red blob. But basically, uh, a huge portion of Southern Africa is, is a big volcanic basin. Better sediments, sails. And then we have the lava uh, cover. Also, uh, we have the, one of the biggest uh, uh, large provinces throughout time. It's not really visible on this, but you can see some remnants. Um, here we have some remnants of volcanic rocks in, in, uh, uh, in Portugal and Morocco. And it's part of the central Atlantic Magmatic Province from 200 million years ago. And also, we have these huge basins in, in Brazil. Uh, so in one is an, an, uh, an Amazonian basin that's also affected by volcanic uh, rocks of, of, of this age. And of course we had the Northeast Atlantic uh, 50,000 years ago, coinciding with the PETF uh, climate event. Yeah, <coughs> this is basically what I'm saying. Uh, associated with this, we had a war of sorts, extinctions. And of course we had the Deccan traps, controversial, uh, correlates in time with the uh, ships from the impact, as I mentioned. <coughs> But I, I won't really go into this, but uh, yeah, the impact community is um, uh, it's a strong group in, in, in this debate. Extinction, yes. Um, so is there any consensus about uh, what happened during these bomb events, uh, uh, these extinctions and these global uh, warming events? It's hard to say, but at least uh, there is a feeling, or there is a tendency for saying that solid earth degassing could have been important. Uh, as a driver mechanism behind <coughs> some of these uh, events. So, what do I mean by solid earth degassing in this respect? Well, if you look at direct uh, uh, effects related to large transformers, certainly we can have basaltic degassing from, from the magma, CO2, SO2, and also the process uh, I'm working with, the, the sediment heating from all the cylinders, can definitely release methane, CO2 from organic matter. <coughs> SO2 if, uh, if uh, uh, evaporized, for instance, are heated, HCl, and also until uh, chloride, if organic matter and salt rocks are heated. You can also uh, think about the indirect degassings, uh, for instance, uh, the dissociation of gas hydrates. This was very favored uh, from the early 1990s, also, the work of the particular uh, uh, in the US. Stagnant ocean models and uh, degassing H2S, the digital decomps uh, work. So there's, a, there's different, uh, definitely many degassing uh, scenarios if you want to call them that that can uh, explain <coughs> perhaps some of these events. 
if you zoom in on, on uh, the, the contact metamorphic particles when sedimentary basins are, are heated and gases are released, uh, the gas that you get is really depending on the sediment type that you heat. For instance, if you heat shales or petroleum bearing rocks, you get carbon gases, mostly methane and CO2, depending on the hydrogen type. If you heat the hydrides and propanes, you get sulfur gases and also carbon gases. So, the composition of all sediments, at least in my view, is, is one of the driving factors behind why you get extinctions and uh, not uh, correlated with these larger influences. Of course, the, the effect, the ultimate effect of the atmosphere or the biosphere, will necessarily depend on the size of the cells, <coughs> how much volume of sediments and how much gas you actually heat. And this really also a really important mechanism how these gases are released from deep basins and to the atmosphere. The solution is the formation of pipe structures, these pipes that I mentioned, and again pipe structures. But of course, the release can also be diffuse in terms of uh, um, more like seepage here to the seafloor or to, to uh, directly on to the atmosphere. Extinction mechanisms, important topic. I would like to stress that there's not really a consensus about extinction mechanisms related to, to mass extinctions. There's a lot of different ideas, and many of them correlate or or in some relationship to, uh, to the basic the, the events that people not think unfolded during the process. Uh, one of the most important uh, explanations for extinctions is climate changes. And for instance, uh, a sudden increase in global temperature, which did of course influence habitats uh, in the oceans. It did also uh, increase temperature, reduce oxygen. Increase pH based on <coughs> higher partial pressures of CO2. Um, other terrestrial mechanisms is, for instance, ozone destruction. Uh, if you release gases, for instance, uh, halocarbons that you destroy the ozone layer, uh, you get really high levels of UV radiation. And generally, this, this is probably the most important mechanism this kind of black box environmental degradation, if you store for acid, ash, volcanic winters, etc. So there's many ideas, but not really any consensus, at least how, how I see it. So, uh, when working with volcanic basins, and trying to link the processes uh, to bomb events, then one of the main challenges is actually to do this, to, to do this link. How can we be sure that we uh, actually, the geological structures that we see in the field had an effect on the environment, uh, as I said, 250 million years back in time. Some of the requirements we able to do this is that we definitely need realistic mechanisms based on the geology that we can see in the field. So, for instance, I need to find the pipes, uh, these pipes, to pretend that this mechanism is important and pipe the gas can happen. So I need to understand for these pipes. All that in time uh, between process and, uh, and basically boundary events, this is a major problem because uh, the status of data, data techniques. And also the duration of some of these crises. So we will come back to a bit, a bit later. We need a substantial carbon source, at least if you want to work solid earth, the gas and gas avoid mechanism. We may have to need to understand the consequences of the gassing. We need that the right of complexes. And uh, ideally we also need a trace or cause and effect, not simply saying that this occurred within the site saving time of span. And this is also uh, uh, yeah, a big difficult field. Okay, so let's look at uh, one of these volcanic basins uh, and how they look like. Uh, this particular uh, picture is uh, from a small airplane, a small airplane in the Karoo Basin in South Africa. What we see here, basically all of the topography is not flat, and all these mountains are sills and they represent the contact oils. So this is uh, a typical volcanic basin, and if you go around and study sills, so this kind of climbing sills, about 9 meters thick. Uh, we have been dealing with uh, geochemistry of the cell, uh, geochemistry of the contact, metamorphism, the study of pipes, etc. Uh, in particular, to deal with the, this time issue, uh, if, if the timing of volcanism, and then in particular this type of what we call the sub volcanism uh, part uh, with all the cells, if they correlate in time with the crisis or not, that's really important. So, what we did in, in uh, Peru Basin. Uh, was to go to uh, all the cells that we see red, and we basically want to try to we try to date them, let them correlate the, the ages, we want to 
what is known from this virus and uh, global warming. And we were lucky to find uh, serpents in the dish rock, so we can basically do the, the best dating possible uh, with, with serpents. And the ages are plotted here with this program, and they fall roughly between 1.82 and 1.83 million years ago. So this, um, this is basically the best we can do, and it's, you can say that all the scales uh, have the same edge, which is statistically not unlikely. Uh, but you can equally say that they were placed in the Google Basin over the time span of 1 million years. So in order to really tie process and, and environment together, we don't really get any further, which is a pity. We looked at covering metamorphism and venting, um, both uh, on world, uh, world studies and also this type of, uh, let's say, global or basin scale um, metamorphism. So we use realistic geometries and then do chemical calculation and then couple this to, you know, to maturation organic matter and, and, uh, and carbon gas formation. We also have been dealing with pipe formation, using fantastic pipes exposed in the blue basin, big elevators. The contents of some of these craters, and they took a lot of the look like this in, in, in the field. And quite some fresh shaded shales, and really good evidence that gases went through this and then to the atmosphere, um, together with uh, at the same time as this uh, climate uh, change. But on the the really key, if you look at the global uh, carbon cycle and, and carbon storage reservoirs, and um, one of the reasons why I like sills. For instance, in comparison to the lavas, it's really the potential to mobilize some of the, the, the carbon stored in rocks. If you look at, the, at this slide from Darby uh, CC, uh, <coughs> yeah. uh, we can look at the, the, the non oil, gas, and coal reservoirs, big one, 3,000 liters of carbon stored. And then if you look at carbon in terms of disturb, dispersed carbon, organic carbon in rocks, and carbonates, it's up to maybe <coughs> 100 million liters of carbon. Is this immense reservoir? So what I'm saying is that uh, the cells and the pipes is a good process to, to mobilize some of this uh, this vast carbon uh, deposit in a very short amount of time. We also went to, to Argentina in, in order to try to to find this uh, this uh, twice and uh, climate change in, in proxy data from uh, this black shared sequence and then try to find tough layers. To get data tough, data excursion and correlate with ages in the group. That was fairly success, successful. If we look at the isotopes of organic carbon, that is excursion, which we believe that is the same excursion as we find in other uh, sections uh, globally. And uh, we have been able to date some of these tough layers, and um, have shown them in these yellow colors, which is a slide. I don't have time to go into this uh, detail, but uh, please consult this, uh, this paper. Um, to manage to date some of these top layers, and uh, yeah, you can basically estimate the timing of uh, the excursion for the start and compare it with ages in, in South Africa. Uh, and the ages overlap. So this is estimated 1 to 2 million uh, plus minus uh, a little bit, and correlates with the ages of the uh, census. But, so basically, the global event correlates with probably large province. The timing is good. Um, that the carbon sources from the metamorphism in the uh, basin, which is okay. Uh, the carbon flux is a problem, but we no, don't know the, the total duration. So the question is, can we get any further than this? Um, so basically, the, the problem is to reconcile the uh, duration of this crisis, which is typically in the order of 100,000 to maybe uh, 500,000 uh, years, with the tempo of the deposited process, if you remember the one of the first slides, that the tempo of the duration of lava flows uh, with single fusions. And if you believe that uh, uh, these crises are part of individual effects, then also necessarily these individual effects must have an impact. And then simply a succession of these builds up this whole process. So <clears throat> we got some low volume calculations, um, taking into account uh, lava degassing, and also um, the works of uh, organic rich shales. And then we, what we say is that one event, one cell, has a duration of 100 years, which is realistic from a geological perspective, 
and then we calculate the maximum effect of all of those that carbon to the gas stratosphere. And this is the typical uh, top of values we get. Uh, Lower the gas in, uh, lower or the salty lower has really low CO2 concentrations, which leads to them a really low um, potential global warming. If you take into account the contributions, um, then might the gas in this range, in a 100 year uh, perspective, which will give us global warmings of uh, between 1 and 3 degrees Celsius. Of course, the global warming depends on. Um, the specifics of the gases, if you get methane or, or CO2. Uh, Marco Rocher has a poster on this uh, topic uh, just there, so if you have uh, more questions to this, then please go and see him. Uh, he has also used the global uh, product climate model. We can actually uh, model the changes in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the biosphere, the vegetation cover, as a function of temperature. So basically, what you see now is that it changes in the vegetation when uh, the earth is warming. And what you see is that there's not really any big changes in, in terms of vegetation changes, which is strongly suggestion that also uh, global warming alone is not the main driver for extinction. What you see here, this blue stuff is, is glaciation. And so Marco also did the calculations backwards, so the simulations backwards. So, you <coughs> take the, the end program world, which is here at zero as a reference, and you cool it. Then, of course, you get a much bigger effect on, on, the, on the biosphere effect if you're warming it based on the glaciation. So, that's a really interesting effect. End program, 250 uh, million years ago, the biggest extinction. Correlates in time with formation of the Southern Traps Lodging Province. Which uh, we have done three work at, um, three times now uh, since 2004. Uh, so now I want to present some of the results from, from those campaigns. And you see here in the red is the centrifuges, the background is the sedimentary basins underneath the lodging province, and in purple colors we have lavas and car plastic uh, material. In addition, we have all this, uh, these pipe structures here shown in, in, uh, in, in green and, and black. So there's probably hundreds of these pipes, and they fill with uh, magnetites. Really spectacular top of the geology. So what we believe happened in Siberia. This is a reconstruction. Uh, we have uh, the laws here. Uh, first day. This red is the outline of the signatures. In uh, in uh, blue here we have an enormous salt base, the Cambrian salt, so to two kilometers in thickness. And in that salt package, this is what we have all the pipes. So the idea is that uh, the cells of some lava accumulation, magma accumulations in the basin, leads to overpressure, degassing, and mobilization of all these top of volatiles that can be mobilized from sediments, which includes a lot of different uh, um, gas species, as I mentioned, mentioned. So let's go to the field. Um, I mentioned the salt, it's really spectacular. We saw some of this uh, salt uh, uh, in course that the Russians did uh, in, in the 80s. And into the salt, we have, we have signatures. It's really a neat way to mobilize, uh, uh, for instance, hydrocarbons. If you go, can go to some of the craters uh, and, uh, and the, the pipes that are present, this is a, yeah, it's a, it's a picture of a core from one of the pipes I've studied. You see a bit of rock fragments, um, not only for salts in this case, but we have calcites here, and also magnified field in the voids in, in, in this pressure. A bit higher up, uh, in the crate of this, of this pipe, that crate to lay sediments. The typical look like this, it's all volcanic plastic, it contains volcanic and you know, volcanic material in the, in the siltstone and sandstone in the size range. And uh, Kirsten Fista, which is also here at has a poster about this. This creature shows some of her, her recent results. This should really look into that the deep that's one of these crater lake uh, uh, sections. It, this again is a magnetite part of the now we get into the base of the crater. Uh, all the volcanics, there's a lot of calcite in these rocks. It's basically like a natural laboratory for, uh, for carbon storage. Uh, a lot of um, um, calcite storage in a beautiful formation of the salt material. Um, so it's kind of a cold, closed basin, calcite cement. It's probably very high sanitation rates. And then we assume, I estimate that this, this, this uh, Hello Lake was, was infilled um, in a few hundreds to maybe a few thousand years. 
so uh, Kirsten has been testing the idea that uh, carbon gas experiment uh, got through this, this hype in a long time scale, um, doing a lot of geochemical studies. The uh, local organic matter has this double high stop excursion at the base in, in this interval. And there also an excursion in the high stops of the calcite of the carbonates. We think that the best explanation for this is that uh, the carbon gas is actually persisted uh, throughout the history of the lake, but with the pulse of, let's say, organic derived carbon in, uh, as an initial stage, and then followed by the volcanic carbon uh, history. Still many questions related to uh, some of the specifics in this area and also some of the processes that will not happen in this area, for instance, explosive mechanism, and how that relates to then current extinction. Contact metamorphism of coal has also got some uh, aquatic authors have suggested, but it's not really um, used well in this area. And also, is there all the top of near field toxic aesthetics that we can get at, in addition to this great that are not isolated based on this, but more connected to the exterior um, uh, the environment. So I uh, will uh, finish off by showing you some slides we filmed with you last summer, uh, some of the initial results from that. Basically, this is the severe traps. It's a bit more of a kilometer section. You see all these individual power flows. Already a block in columnar uh, jointed the power flows. Um, surprising when you correlate what we see in the field with the Russian geologic, geologic maps. There's really a little volcanic ash in this slide. There's nothing on this. Uh, we could see, uh, even though it was supposed to be there on the map. So, the hint towards that the Russians actually did some misinterpretations of lava law flows, and uh, which also could hint that uh, explosive volcanic activity was probably not that important throughout the whole period of the large and explosive formation. Locally, yes, abundant uh, evidence for volcanic explosive activity. All these white cliffs are uh, tough. Uh, tough rocks, which are subsequently altered to really strange rocks full of scapulite and calcium, but that's a different, different story. So, um, ash locally, I don't know. Another important uh, feature is that we found a lot of evidence for the presence of surface water at the time of the initial stages of the large transport formation of the lava eruptions. We found this very nice section, which is uh, basically a lake section, which is filled in with uh, kind of plastic material. The in front is uh, this drop of the tree stem sticking out of this, uh, this uh, paddle lake, which is actually fairly similar to, to what you see at one of the campsites. Uh, the Russians made a dam and they flooded a fairly big uh, reservoir and then this dead tree standing and they're basically surrounded by uh, material avoided from the, um, the salty flows. It's fairly good analog actually to probably what happened to 50 million years ago. And uh, I lost. Uh, Point which I'd like to mention is this topic about gas from coal. We did find this extremely nice sequences in the southernmost sedimentary section just below the lava flows. We have coals. You see the uh, nice sedimentations here. This is the big one here. And the second big one, third, and, and fourth. And in between these, there's coal beds uh, in the sandstones. So there's basically a lot of evidence for coal metamorphism, but not eruptions related to coal or, or pipes. So the pipes are present in a different uh, part of the basin. So to sum up, some really general aspects here. The main challenge linking, uh, let's say, geology to, to flux data is basically to what do we need in order to link this. Time scales are certainly important, as demonstrated in the river and the timber, but it's not sufficient. We need, we need something more. To say what that is, is uh, it's, uh, it's uncertain. Individual cells can cause global warming on a 10 year time scale. I think this is a really important step to understand it's kind of the piecemeal uh, evolution of all these processes. And contact metamorphism to the really higher flux of carbon to the atmosphere and play below the gassing. And uh, this can be uh, demonstrated by the new flux data that we have from these operating frameworks. So, thank you.